given. All stats and of and that's the money. Thank you. What a beautiful wind time. I love you, Pam Russell and Pam. So uh continue to remember Miss Pam and her family passing up her brother. Merlin Jr. They call him Jr. So he he gave me the prayers. What else am I supposed to say this morning? Good to see everybody come out of Sunday school this morning. Uh, I asked you uh Miss Sherry. She said uh, 35 people in Sunday school. Praise the Lord for that. We started a new class up over here, Brother Wade's teaching it. He's a parish and parish class. And, uh, so we'd like to see it grow, uh, good slow growth, and uh, learn more about the Lord. Amen. 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 That's going to be the first song we sing. I want to know more about my Jesus. So uh, we've been praying for Jeff Mark. He's a local guy to off the scalpel. He's his head or left in a home for about two weeks. So, so I did with I see him uh, Thursday one. Right. And it was their anniversary. His wife was up there. She's up there every day. But after he left, uh, they was turned him over and he held his eyes up for just a second. So good news on that. He's slowly coming back around. So keep them in prayer. Keep uh, uh, Miss Diane and Mr. Harry in prayer. She goes to Henry tomorrow for some work. And she has to church pray for them. And uh, several more prayer for this. I need to start wrapping that. It's just a good day to be in the Lord's house. Appreciate everybody coming out to the rest home uh, Friday night. It's always a special treat. We had a special treat right there toward the end. So uh, we'll have a special singer come in. And so we just had a good time with those folks out there. Keep Wayne and Cindy in the prayers down there. And several more that we stopped to see when we were down there. Just a lot to be thankful for the Lord answered prayers. And a lot of times, reading. How many people in the garden? A lot of people in the garden. I was reading this week about the parable of the seed. And, uh, it'd be nice if we could just plant that seed and tomorrow harvest it. We'll start eating, but we have to wait. The Lord teaches us patience on that. And a lot of times, a lot of people have been for Brother Jeff. A lot of times it just takes uh, time. God's timing is not our time, okay? But uh, we don't know what kind of seeds are planted in a situation like that. That people trust in the Lord and their faith grows stronger and all. So a lot of times in situations like us, without a pastor here at the church right now, we're praying. We're praying for a pastor. The Lord has sent us to get here for a while. And uh, so we're praying and praying. We, we, we won't miss the results. So sometimes it's not that way. So uh, the Lord teaches us patience and the power of the sea. Uh, he does that. I was reading uh, Luke chapter 15 this week about uh, Jesus talked uh, about the power of the law sheep and how the Lord goes and uh, retrieves one back of 99. And, uh, uh, that, that sheep didn't just, uh, if you raise dog, your dog is not enough to go, right? But if you raise sheep, those oh, sheep just barely wander away. They don't, uh, they don't go fast. And a lot of times, us as Christians, we're like sheep. And we're slow. Something uh, we miss a, a week of church, and we miss two weeks of church, and next thing you know, we slowly wander away. And the Lord comes and searches us back up and we'll preach on the parable of all Son. He deliberately left. And uh, he realized that the right way was to come back to the and also, uh, right between those two parables, is the parable of the lost coin, a woman that uh, lost the coin and gets to study about it. Back in those times when she got married, she uh, had a little uh, pouch that she carried her money in. Uh, she lost that coin, though, the treasure coin. And, uh, she cleaned the house and looked and looked and looked for it, and finally she found it. But that coin didn't just up and leave. It was accidentally lost. So. The Lord always wants us to come closer, closer, and closer. And I'm thankful for that. And as that brought, we talked about magnetism to the earth this morning in Sunday school. But the Lord, His Word draws us closer and closer and closer. And that's where we all want to be. It's closer and closer and closer to the Lord. I hope that wasn't your message this morning. No, it was. Anyway, we, we appreciate everybody. It's just good to be in the Lord's house, see a few faces, and been with us in a while, and appreciate y'all being back in our visitors. It's just a great day to be alive, and I'm glad that the Lord has watched over us for another week. Uh, by the way, you uh, dismiss Sunday school hour and prayer, please. Our most gracious heaven, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this 
about when you have the delay. So we thank you for just getting us through another week. For some of us, it's difficult work, but it's so nice. <coughs> it's just so pleasant knowing you. Know, we can rely on you, rely on your strength and all our own experience. Lord, we thank you just for another beautiful day. We thank you for this all your creation. Lord, most of all, I thank you for your son that I was made.
walk in truth. Amen. Amen. We want to know more about the Lord. Stop to think about it. Let's say one more song. This song, uh, I was up early this morning reading. And, uh, if you go up there 151, turn right to about five or six miles over there. There's old stone church on the left. There's a Civil War hospital and uh, for both sides. But uh, this song in 1878 was first sung there. First time it was ever sung either. It was leaning on their last in arms. Uh, I thought he was a traveling uh, choir director just in Dalton, Chattanooga area. He wrote the song. He was there that Sunday night and he sang it. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's sing it this morning. Pray for us, she sings this song. my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all.
is expedient for me to go away, but I'll send you another comforter to guide you from day to day. So they tarry at Jerusalem for Take your copy of God's Word this morning and open to uh, the book of Romans, chapter number 5. The book of Romans, chapter number 5. And, uh, glad that you are here today and we're just going to uh, share with you uh, the last in our series of uh, talking about uh, Call It Grace. And today uh, we're going to talk about the uh, wonderful grace of Jesus. Um, there was a husband and wife who uh, really didn't love each other. Uh, the man was very demanding, so much so that he prepared a list of rules and regulations for his wife to follow. And he insisted that she read them over every day and obey them to the letter. Among other things, uh, his do's and don'ts indicated such details as what time she had to get up in the morning, uh, when his breakfast should be served, and how the housework should be done. After several long years, the husband died. As time passed, the woman fell in love with another man, uh, one who dearly loved her. Soon they were married, and the husband did everything he could to make his new wife happy, continually showering her with tokens of his appreciation. 
One day, as he was uh, cleaning house, or she was cleaning house, she found tucked away in a drawer the list of commands that her first husband had drawn up for her and presented to her. And as she looked it over, uh, it dawned on her that even though her present husband had not given her any kind of list, she was doing everything that the first husband required of her anyway. And she realized that she was so devoted to this new husband that her deepest desire was to please him out of love and not out of obligation. And when God's grace takes over in our lives, we begin to want to serve Him out of love and not out of obligation. Amen. And so uh, we want to look at that today and talk about the wonderful grace of Jesus. Look in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse number 6, and we will read from there. It says... Uh, for when ye were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, thank You for today. Thank You for uh, the glory and the beauty of it. And Lord, thank You for... Uh, the wonderful time of worship that we've already experienced through the, the songs that were sung today and how that, that touched our hearts in a special way. And now, Lord, I just pray your blessings upon us as we look into your Word and we look to see what your Word has to say to us today. And so, Father, I pray that if uh, there are those who are here that maybe uh, they have never uh, encountered your grace, that today would be the day that they would uh, turn their life over to you and they would experience your grace for the very first time. Or maybe there are believers who are here that they've just, as Keith said, they've just kind of eased away from you. And, and Lord, today's the day that you want to call them back to yourself. And Father, that you want to just uh, have them recommit their life to you. So, Father, we put this time in your hands and ask for you to touch it and bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Because God's grace uh, has the ability to transform lives, uh, it truly makes it wonderful, grace of Jesus, when we look at it. So, what are some important lessons that we can learn from this passage of Scripture that I believe are very important for us as believers and even for those who are not believers that they can say, hey, I want that. I want to I wanna taste of God's grace today. I think that the first lesson that we can uh, uncover today in this particular passage takes us from verse 6 and 7 where that we see that grace defines us. Grace defines where we are in our relationship with the Lord that uh, when we look at this and we see uh, because Paul gives us some idea. He said uh, in verse 6, the first part of that, he said, for when we were yet without strength. In other words, Paul says we are helpless without the grace of God. That before coming to know Christ, we are totally helpless in our sin. Matter of fact, Dr. Stephen Lawson uh, said this. He said the word helpless means to be totally powerless. The idea is to be weak, to be infirm, to be feeble, to be frail, to be impotent, to be sickly, to be totally unable to do anything to gain or earn acceptance with God. He said, I mean, uh, there is nothing that we had uh, to even contribute. 
We were completely helpless. If you're helpless, you're helpless. Uh, you have no help whatsoever. And so Paul says in this particular passage, he says, For when we were yet without strength, you see, it, he's talking about what Dr. Lawson says is, is the idea is that you, you've got somebody uh, who is uh, maybe bedridden, and they've been bedridden for a long time, and they can't move, they can't do anything for themselves. They are totally helpless. And when we think about our own lives, and we think about where we are in our sin, we are totally helpless. We can't help ourselves apart from the grace of God. You see, we can't, we can't do this on our own. We have to have somebody to pick us up out of the miry clay of sin and put our feet on the rock. We can't do that on our own. And so he says that we are helpless in our sin. We were without strength. And so when we look at this and we see that we are helpless, but then he, he goes on a little further in this. He says, In due time Christ died for the ungodly. You see, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for you and for me because when we are born, we are born in sin. And so not only are we helpless, but I want you to know this morning, we are hopeless. Our life is hopeless without Jesus. We are hopeless in our sin. Again, referring to what Dr. Lawson uh, had to say about this, he said uh, he had to die in our place if we were to have the salvation that we so desperately need. Christ died for, and I want to, uh, to make a big deal out of that word for, this tiny little preposition, he says. Uh, but he says, there is a world of theology in this word for. It means on behalf of, or for the sake of, for the benefit of, and in that little preposition is contained the truth of the substitutionary, vicarious death of Christ for us. He died in our place and for our benefit. You see, there was nothing that we could do with, as a 13-year-old boy when I realized that I was lost, when I realized that I was an unbeliever, there was nothing I could do for myself. I was hopeless. I didn't have any hope because the Bible said that I was a sinner. The Bible said that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so I was a sinner, and at 13, I came face to face with that reality. But I also realized that I was hopeless, and the only hope that I had rested in Jesus. And the only hope that you have rests in Jesus. The only hope that our world has rests in Jesus. You see, the government is not going to make things any better. The education system is not going to make things any better. It is only when we put our hope and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ do things ever get better. And so if you're here today and you realize that you are helpless in your sin, you realize that you are hopeless in your sin, I want you to know that Jesus is the answer. But then we see this. Because grace defines us as being helpless and hopeless, but grace also defines us as being homeless. Listen to what he says in verse 7. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. In other words, what he's saying is, is that most of us are not willing to die for somebody else. Now, I would be willing to step in front of a bullet. 
I would be willing to step in front of a raging car. I would be willing to step in front of some raging maniac in order to save Kathy's life. But some stranger out here on the street? I don't know so much. I'd like to think I could be a hero and do that, but I don't know whether I could or not. But he said, you know, in that situation, we are we're basically homeless in our sin. I've had some I've had some dealings with with through chaplaincy. I've had some dealings with with homeless people. And there's one word that we can use to describe homeless people. They are destitute. They don't have a home. They don't have a roof over their head. Most of them, the clothes they have on their back is the only clothes that they have. They have no earthly possessions. When I walk, when I walk through our house and... I walk through the garage, and I walk through the attic, and I walk through the, uh, it's really not a basement, but under the house, I can walk through there, and I, they're worldly possession to me, but it's really a bunch of junk to other people. But homeless people, they don't have that. What they have on their back, and maybe what they could carry on their back or carry in their hand, that's all they have. And I want you to know, for us to understand that we are helpless and we are hopeless without God's grace, that we are homeless without God's grace, that the only thing that we can carry is all that we have. And all we can carry is our sin. And so we need something else. We need somebody else. We need Jesus in our life. So Paul tells us, he says that, that grace defines us where we are. But he moves to the next part of this in verse 9 through 11. He tells us, excuse me, in verse 8, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. In verse 8, he tells us that grace defends us. I want you to know that, uh, you know, we may not have a lot of people who would come to our rescue and defend us. But I want you to know today that in your sin, where you are in life, however, whatever's going on in your life, Jesus is willing by his grace to defend you. He will defend you. You see, I think that, that uh, we see in verse 8, I want you to see the person who defends us. Paul begins verse 8 with two words. He says, but God. You see, he, he paints this picture of us being helpless and hopeless and homeless, and then he says, but God. He says, but God, God is the one who, who can defend us and who will defend us. God is the only one who can defend us against our sin. And so he says, God defends us and he is the only person who can and will. But then I want you to see the plot of the defendant. I want you to see where we are. I want you to see the, the, the picture of where we are in our sin. Notice what Paul says. He says, but God commendeth or demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. You see, God demonstrates His love for us. He demonstrates that grace to us. How does He do that? When we look back to the cross. When we look back to the cross. Because that's the only hope that we have. That is where grace comes from when Jesus died on that cross so that we might have 
eternal life. You see, because, because He defines us as sinners, then we have to believe that Jesus died for our sin. Jesus died so that we might live. Otherwise, we're going to live so that we die and spend an eternity in hell. Oh, did, did I say that? A lot of people won't say that anymore. But that's the truth of it. There are only two places, two destinations. You have heaven and you have hell. And if you continue to live apart from the grace of God, if you continue to live a life of helplessness, hopelessness, and homelessness, hell is where you're going to end up. But he says here that the plight, our, our, the picture of the defended, of those who need to be defended, it's that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, because we are sinners by nature. So he says, those of us who need to be defended by grace, those of us who need to be defended by God, that God demonstrated His love to us. He showed us His love when Jesus died on the cross. But then we see the price of the defense. The price of that defense is the last part of verse 8. Christ died for us. I want you to know that Christ died for you and for me. He died for a world of lost sinners. He died for us. And I want you to know, I, I, I want you to understand something today. That there, are, there are people out there who will tell you and they will, they, they will try to convince you, oh, well, listen, Jesus really didn't die. Jesus just fainted on the cross. And when they put him in that, when they put him in that cool tomb, he just revived. I want you to know that if there had if there had been a deputy coroner at the crucifixion he would have taken Jesus pulse and he would have declared him legally dead that's the only way God could pay for our sin is to have His Son who was sinless to die for the sinful. And so, the price of the defense is Jesus died for us. He died for us. And then Paul says in verses 9 through 11, he tells us that not only does grace define us in our sin and grace defend us, but I want you to know that, that the best part of it is grace delivers us. Grace delivers us from our sin. Look at verse 9. I want you to see the, the liberation of grace, the where that, that we are set free. He says in verse 9, he says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I've read accounts of things that have happened in the past where that people have been held in prison, whether it was uh, whether it was in a, a war torn country or, or or whatever, but they've been that they've been held prisoner, and and the the army comes in and liberates them and sets them free, and they 
they cut the chains off of those doors and they set those people free and they can go about their life. Well, I want you to know that grace will liberate you. Grace will set you free. You won't have to live like some people do, bound up by all this uh, legalism and formalism and, and trying to keep this law and that law, but you can be free in your grace and free from your sin. He says much more than having now been justified by His blood. That word justified, some of you probably have heard this, it, it makes us just as if we had never sinned. When I, when I graduated from high school, my, my major in college was, was business. And back in the old days, some of y'all might can relate to this. Some of y'all won't even understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but, uh, but in the old days, when they taught accounting, they taught that you put something on one side of the page, you had to put something on the other side of the page of equal value. So that when you get to the end of the page, both of them end in a zero and you balance. I can't even tell you what that's called, but that it had a fancy name that the accounting professor called it. But I want you to know that justification is this, is that God has all of our sin, past, present, and future, over here on a, on a, a scale, and He's putting all of our sin over here, and it's weighted down... And the scale looks like this. And when Jesus shed His blood, He justifies us and He brings that in balance. Matter of fact, that word justified in the Greek is a, an accounting term and it means to settle the account. It means to balance the account. And so Jesus' blood, Jesus' death on the cross balances the account and brings it to zero so that we have no sin to account for. But not only is there the liberation of grace, but there is the labor of grace. Look at verse 10. He says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You see, the labor that Jesus went through, the pain and the agony. We talked about last Sunday night. I shared with you some, some pictures that I made while I was in Israel years ago. And, and I shared with you the picture of Golgotha. And I shared with you the picture of Pilate's judgment hall. And when Jesus was judged there, and the crowd cried, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. And then they led Him out of there and down what is called the Via Della Rosa, down through the streets of Jerusalem outside the city, up to the top of uh, Golgotha and they laid him down and they drove the spikes in his hands and his feet and he was scourged, he was beaten, he was spat upon, his beard was plucked. All of these things that were done to Jesus was the labor of grace so that we might be justified, so that we might be reconciled so that the balance sheet is made to balance so that everything ends in a zero so that we uh, are able to live eternally. But then we see that, that lastly in verse 11 that not only do we see the, the liberation of grace and the labor of grace but 
Paul ends talking about the limitlessness of grace. Look at what he says. He says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement or the reconciliation. You see, that atonement for our sins only comes through Jesus. You cannot get it by working for it like some people think they can. You can't get it by amassing huge amounts of money in your bank account. You can't get it because of your pedigree. I want you to know that you can't experience God's grace in your life personally because of that grandma and grandpa and mama and daddy were Christians and so poof, you're just going to be a Christian. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Each one of us, each one of us has to make that very personal decision to come to Christ, to come to know Jesus as a personal Savior in our life. And so it does not happen just because of who you are. It doesn't happen because of the the, the right side of the tracks that you grew up on. It doesn't happen because of the church that you attend. It doesn't happen because of the amount of education you have. It doesn't happen just because of who you are. It doesn't happen. It only happens when the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ is brought into our life. And that atonement is that His blood that He shed on the cross is applied to our life. And what happens is, is that He puts that blood on our sin, and when God looks at us, He does not see our sin anymore. He sees the blood of His only begotten Son, and that's what atones for our sin. So this morning, I want you to, I want you to understand about calling it grace. I want you to understand today that we call it grace. It is that unmerited favor. It is that that we get that we don't deserve. None of us deserve grace. But God loves us so much, He gives it liberally to those who will trust Him. Those who will follow Him. Those who are willing to answer that call of the Holy Spirit. Miss Patricia, I like what you said. No, he's not an it. He's a he. He, the Holy Spirit, wants to work in your life. And maybe he's working in your life right now. Maybe he is working in your life and he is bringing you face to face with your sin. He is bringing you face to face with the reality that you do not have a personal relationship with Him. And as you look in that spiritual mirror and you see that, 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 that you, you're, you're missing something. You're missing something in your life. And so the hope is that you will enter and taste God's grace and you enter into that atonement you enter into that relationship with Jesus so that you might have eternal life because God has a limitless supply you can't, you can't run that supply kind of like this little story Billy Graham it says don't know if this is true or not said Billy Graham was driving through a little town one day and he was speeding a little bit and police officer pulled him over and he said you know I'm gonna have to give you a ticket and he said you're gonna have to go to court so uh, Dr. Graham uh, asked him where the courthouse is and he goes and the judge uh, is seated there and uh, he comes up and uh, he 
uh, guilty or not guilty. Dr. Graham says, I'm guilty. I was speeding. And he says, well, that'll be $10 a mile for every mile you were over the speed limit. And suddenly the judge recognized Dr. Graham. And he said, oh, oh, uh, you violated the law. The fine must be paid. But I'm going to pay it for you. And the story says the judge took the $10 out of his own wallet, stapled it to the ticket, handed it to the court clerk, and then carried Billy Graham for a steak dinner. I want you to know something. In our sin, we're all speeding. And the officer Jesus is saying, your feet. I'm going to write you a ticket. But the judge says, I recognize you and I want to pay the price for you. I want you to be free from this fine. I want you to be free from this ticket. And he paid the price so that we might have The wonderful, wonderful grace of Jesus. Every head back and every eye closed. As our musicians are coming and they're they're preparing a hymn of invitation. I just want to pray this morning that that God is preparing you right now to respond in obedience. That God wants you just to to move. God wants you just to. Uh, to step out from where you are. God wants you just to, to obey Him today because it is God's desire right now. At this very moment, it is God's desire for you to come to Christ. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand and sing. And if God is speaking to you, and obedience is what you need to do. I'm going to ask you to step out on the first words of the first verse. Don't delay. You just come. You say, I, I need to taste of God's grace. Or, or listen, I've already tasted of God's grace, but I just need to recommit my life. So we just want to we want to ask God to bless this time, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to respond. Father, as your Holy Spirit, moves up and down the aisles into hearts and lives. Father, I pray right now that, that people have already decided that they're going to obey you today, that they're going to do what you are asking of them. And, Father, that you'll just give them courage right now to step out on these first words and to just do that because as they step out, others may step out to follow them. And so, Lord, just use us as a key to unlock this service for you to pour your spirit out upon us and for us to be able to glory in what you do in Jesus name amen as we stand together and we begin to sing Come on.
Louisiana. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you've already tasted God's grace. But maybe you are just burdened down because of something that's going on in your life. You're just carrying a burden. God say, come unto me. I want to I want to relieve you of that burden. As we sing this next verse, if you're, just, if you're carrying that burden, whatever it is, would you just come today and just kneel here at the front, sit on these pews at the front, and just unload that burden, just give it all to the Lord today. Would you do that? Would you just come unto Him and unload all of that uh, before Him today as we sing?